Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. This is VK7 uh, Tango Whiskey at the mic of VK7 Oscar Tango Charlie, and I've got Steve VK7 OO in the studio. Hello, Steve. Good evening, Justin. How are you going? Good, thank you. Excellent, excellent. And this, of course, is our DATV Experimenters Night. I'll just do acknowledgement of country. Um, in recognition of the deep history of the history and culture of this island, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Uh, the traditional owners of the land upon which this presentation is happening on, the Muanina people. So, I've got Steve in the studio. Steve's a bit of a uh, SSTV guru. Nut. <laughs> Nut, yes. <laughs> well, he does run the uh, the 20 metre uh, SSTV cam. I do. You I do? I've been running that for more than 15 years. 15 years? Oh, oh my God, how many images have you got? <laughs> <laughs> There must be thousands of them. I think at the 10 year mark I had 100,000, so. And I've got them all too. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few there, but anyway. Okay. And we're getting lots every day at the moment. Okay. So, yeah, it's good. Excellent. And what's, what's the setup that you're using right at the moment for, for like, antenna okay. and. Uh, the antenna is a 3 on Yagi. Okay. Most often beaming 60 degrees, so a little bit east of northeast. Okay, okay. Um, but I sometimes turn it north. Okay. But those are the only two directions that ever seems to face. Okay. Uh, northeast seems to pick up everything, and north seems to pick up almost as much anyway. So, um, But the equipment behind that, always MMS STV. Yep. Um, lately, or the last 12 months or so, I've been using an SDR. Ooh, and okay. that is extremely challenging because MMS, STV and, and SDRs do not get on. Right. Um, okay. So it's Word of warning for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It, uh, it is something that you, you don't want to do unless you're really prepared to, to, to do, do the hard slog because right. they, they just don't get on. Okay. Um, but the current setup is a laptop running um, uh, Windows 10. Okay. It has um, a SDR console, which is an excellent program. Okay. Um, the SDR, SDR console uh, is feeding its um, input from uh, an ASPY HF, okay. yes. HF um, Discovery, okay. via um, SPY server. Okay. And, the reason f and the SPY server is running on the same computer, which is like, why would you bother doing that? Hmm. And the reason I'm doing that is because two other computers are also running off that same SPY server. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Now here's the challenge, because the... As I said, MMS, STV and SDR programs don't get on. An SDR console on this particular laptop plays up havoc. Right. 
Okay. The, the audio delay is just, is just unreliable Ooh, and okay. results in very bad pictures. Okay. So I have a second computer, not a very powerful one, it's a second computer, somewhere else, doing exactly the same job. Oh, okay. And it's pretty good. Okay. So it supplies the image, whilst the machine running uh, the, the main laptop supplies all the other information that I provide okay. at the same time. And then a third computer will do the upload to the web, <laughs> like using the FTP widget, which everybody knows about. Okay. But that third computer is also running w, WSJTX and listening or spotting FT8 on the same antenna on the same radio. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty cool. It's very cool. <laughs> but, but, uh, it sounds like an absolute nightmare, but anyway. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's not that difficult. But like I said, the challenge is getting it working reliably. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. and that, that's, that's an ongoing challenge. And at the moment, the, the Windows 10 laptop just does not want to play ball, and it's Windows 10 that's the problem. Yep, okay. Um, because you cannot turn off the updates in Windows 10. It uh, frequently yes. wants to restart. It does this, it yes. does that. It causes all sorts of grief and upsets SDR console no end. Okay. So that's why I have a, a Windows 7 machine in the background just sitting there receiving pictures. Doesn't do anything else, just receives the pictures. Yeah, okay. And those are the pictures I end up uploading. Yeah, okay. But I get okay. other information and strategic um, data and stuff that I add to the picture. Yep. Because if you look on my website, there's a waterfall underneath it. Yep. It used to be a signal graph, but I've changed it to a waterfall now. Okay, okay. That waterfall comes off the main Windows 10 laptop, okay. which is using a screen grab program. So yep. it, it's involved. <laughs> Yeah, just a little. <laughs> but it's fun. It's so, a load of fun. So I refer back to the guru status. <laughs> no, just a nut. <laughs> now, the, the reason I, I got Steve into the studio was when we have our Thursday night SSTV nights, um, which is our statewide SSTV nights, Steve, when we, we were... We had uh, a few nights ago yep. a whole lot of Star Wars themed pictures <laughs> that came up, and Steve then started playing before he um, started transmitting the picture. Came up with um, the Imperial, e Imperial March, the Evil Empire <laughs> March, you know, <laughs> Imperial March out of Star Wars in in tones before he started transmitting. And I went, ooh, I like that. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> and it's a standard feature of MMSS TV. Okay. Well, so... Oh, standard feature. We got Steve into the studio, and we'll we'll get Steve to go up <laughs> into the laptop. Um, we had a bit of a trouble connecting to the laptop. So what we are actually doing is we've got a camera on the laptop. <laughs> so we're, we're on doing the laptop. A, a, a wireless VGA conversion. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, that sounds much better. Wireless video that's, conversion. That's anyway. much better. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll move over to the laptop. <laughs> Let's see how we go. <laughs> so, we're now looking at Steve's laptop, and that's MMSS TV, is it? Yeah, it's MMSS TV with the um, uh, stock view removed. So oh, okay. MMSS TV can be broken into smaller parts. Okay. Which I normally run it and broken up. Okay. But uh, in this particular case, we've just got the stock view removed. Cool. But other than that, it's the standard program. Now, you'd be familiar with the sound of sending, in this case, we're sending Scotty One. Always, but everyone will hear it sounding like this. So, that initial sound, that is the standard box tone for MMSS TV, and the box tone is simply nothing more than something to key up your transmitter with. Yeah, okay. That's okay. the only reason it's there. You okay. don't need it if you're, um, for instance, broadcasting on FM, yep. or if you're um, using PTT uh, through hardware connection. And that, that, that's nothing to do with the picture. That is literally nothing just the box. Nothing to do with the, the picture. It's, simply, it's what's called a box tone, yep. and it's just a sound to key up the transmitter. Okay, <coughs> okay, cool. That's all it is. So, um, would you pop into options and we'll just have a quick look at that. Yeah. And on the TX tab, you'll see there it says the box tone is standard. Right, so you could switch it to none. Okay. And we'll just have a quick look at how that sounds. So now if we go none, all you'll hear is the viz um, tone, which is two little blips, and then go straight into the picture. Yeah, okay. So that's it. The, okay. the, the, the viz is the first two little blips. Yep. And then yep. it goes into the picture. Okay. So um, that's pretty much it. So then you can do, uh, as you probably noticed, use it to find. Other stuff. <laughs> and, and 
user defined is a load of fun because you can make it whatever you want. Now that was the Imperial March from Star Wars. That was the first one that I made up and I must say that it was a bit rough and ready. Okay. It's not accurate, doesn't sound accurate, but Sounds it good. is recognisable. <laughs> it's definitely recognisable. So uh, if we go into the edit, you'll see that there's a bunch of numbers. Okay. And that's literally all it is, a bunch of numbers. Okay? So 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 you're gonna go into what those numbers mean? I will. Okay. That's well, right. but, 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 let, but let's take a, a well, that's the wrong one. We'll just take a quick side talk, okay. uh, side uh, direction. Um, on the wa9tt.com website, okay. um, this um, PDF is available, which is about the um, tones or playing notes before transmitting on MMS. What was that call sign again? wa9tt.com. Okay. Don't ask me where the actual PDF is, but if you just Google playing notes before transmitting on WA9TT, you'll find it. Cool. Um, so the, it talks about um, the the technical aspect of what's happening within the MSTV, but further down in the article, it talks about the musical aspect. <coughs> Okay. And, and this is the interesting stuff. This is what's what really you know, like where you want to start. So uh, it talks about the size of a note. So an eighth note is two hundred milliseconds. Yep. A quarter note four hundred milliseconds. A half note eight hundred milliseconds. So there's some timing for you if you really want to know that sort of stuff. Love it. Go down further, and it talks about music score. Now I'm not a music musically inclined person, and I really can't read music. So this is actually sort of stuff that I find quite hard. So when I get down to the bottom and um, they talk about middle C on a keyboard. We all know what that is. So the, the, the middle note on a keyboard is um, is C, and then you go up or down from there. And here are the frequencies of one octave above and below middle C. And oh, the there's, all, there's all the information that you need. So you know what middle C is. It's okay. um, two two sixty one point six two six kilohertz. Hertz. Oh, sorry, no, hertz. Sorry. Hertz. Hertz. <laughs> Get, get these uh, HF ideas out of, out of the mind. <coughs> so you go down a couple, then for instance, um, two keys below that is 220 hertz. Yes. Um, and it's, that, that will be A. So it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G A, B, C, D, E, F, G, as you go. So each, each octave of eight notes. <coughs> and you've got the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it? The sharps and flats as well. Um, so that's cool. So that's all the information you need. Now, you can use these numbers, but you can't use decimal points. So okay. you have to go to the nearest large number. Yep. There's a gotcha with this, but anyway, that's the basic information that tells you the, the idea of how to construct your own tones. Cool. So I thought, okay, I'll do this on, on Excel. Um, I can't see my mouse, but there it is. Okay. So on Excel, I decided that I would input um, down the bottom A column, I've got my, my notes, and I've gone one octave down, and middle octave, and an octave up. So I just called them A0, B0, C0, through to A, B, C, D sort of thing, and then A1, B1, C1 sort of thing. Just going up the octaves a little bit. <coughs> Give me a bit of flexibility. And in the C column are the actual frequencies to the nearest whole digit. Okay. All right. Now, here's the gotcha. You can't transmit those numbers <coughs> because the audio bandwidth filter within MMS SSTV will cut them out. Because the lowest frequency that MMS TV sends in the audio bandwidth is 1200 hertz. Oh, okay. And these are all well below it. Yeah, yeah, well and truly. So you try and play those notes and you'll get nothing. So I thought, okay, no worries, I'll just multiply them by three. <laughs> yeah. Go up and a few octaves. Yeah, yeah I've just, <laughs> I literally multiplied them by three. I haven't gone up three octaves because I don't know whether or not these numbers match, but I just took the third harmonic. So and, there's um, a reoccurring error in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> yes. That's why, that's why the, the Imperial March is a little bit rough and ready because well, no, the frequencies are probably not right. It's good. It's good. Um, well, but, the, it. but the idea is good and, and it worked. Okay. I've okay. tried doing other things and, and struggled, so I clearly haven't got it quite right. Okay. Um, but anyway. So now we go back to the other sheet, and I come up with the uh, the notes for Imperial March, which are just written up the top there, 
and in each box on the, on the row I put in the, the note that I want and I just used a, a lookup table to get the, the frequency of that note and then I would manually enter in the duration. Okay. Then I just do a few more jiggeries and pokeries and I end up with this number which you, you can look on the, the top row there is all of the numbers that are necessary to be copied and pasted into MMSS TV. Okay. And that's how I did it. Okay. Uh, it's okay. Moderately, it's it's a clunky, yep. but it's but it's doable because you can repeat this process with yeah. anything you want. Okay. So I did it again with this one down here. Now this was uh, my call sign, um, and we'll see whether or not you can recognise this. <laughs> um, so now I've got my call sign in there, uh, and it's. I'm guessing it's at least 20 words a minute and more. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> See what it sounds like. <laughs> um, <laughs> bit too the, fast? The spacing's not right. Yeah, okay. So, I, I again, I looked up the um, the, the spacing for sorry, the length of a tone, yeah. a, a dip and a dar, and the spacing between them. Yeah. So I don't know what the spacing, but I think the spacing I put between each letter was a dar. Um, which is three dips, which is, yeah. th that's a bit long. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I guessed, I guessed. But anyway. But you can, you can tell it, you can you can hear the VK7. Yeah, so let's, let's slow it down a bit. I've yeah. got it a bit slower. Okay. So we'll take this one here. Um, and copy that and paste it. Uh, let's have this bit of fun. This is good. This I is, love it. <laughs> and, and you can do this with anything. All I'm doing here is holding the shift key down, just clicking anywhere, and then I'm just pasting over the top of what's there. Okay. Okay. Um, so now it'll be slower. Okay. Something's still not right with that. Yeah. Okay, so the timing's wrong. That's okay. But the only one I can get is VK at the beginning, and then it just merges just into in the mush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I clearly haven't programmed it right, but I mean, I'm. The, there's a rhythm to it. That that's the that's that's how you learn. That's how I learned Morse. Well, I, it's, don't, it's, oh, well, I don't know Morse code. I've tried and yeah. I've learned it. It's something I've always struggled with. Ne never refer to it as a dot and a dash. Yeah. Refer to it as a did and a da. Yeah. Because yeah. then when you say it, you actually yeah. say it with the rhythm. So that's, yeah, yeah okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I thought, okay, try something simple. Let's try blah, blah, black sheep. Okay. Um, so we'll try that one. Yeah, cool. And You've been doing a lot of work here. I, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last couple of nights. Um, <laughs> so I, I got a little bit more sophisticated and I even, even included sharps into the uh, Oh, into my the God. List. Okay, so, the black keys. Oh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, you can't do control A, so I've just buggered it up. I'll have to hold the shift key down and select them all. <laughs> this is MMS's TV, mind you. It was written in 2001. I know. So it's, and it's still going. <laughs> it's still... The, the which, is, which is probably the reason why you have so much trouble with SDRs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the, the, pro the problem with SDR, and I'll tell you why, um, SDRs inherently don't have a stable audio output. Yeah, okay. It varies. And yeah. if you look at the audio delay coming out of an SDR, yep. it moves around all over the place. Yeah. And the reason is either there's a processing problem where it slows it down and yep. speeds it up, so yep. there's a bit of wear and flutter in there, or it simply misses packets on, on the input. Yeah. So, and MMSS TV, once it gets more than two milliseconds, it can't handle it. Yeah, it, okay. it, it completely skips something. It, yeah. mo it loses part of the information and it causes your picture to te tear to shreds. Yeah, okay. so, so that's the problem with, it, with okay. SDRs and, and that's the difficult difficulty is you've got to get it as stable as you possibly can. You really can't afford more than a very small variation in the audio delay. Okay. Yeah. So it obviously doesn't prioritise. Did that sound like blah blah black shoot? Just play it again. Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> like I said, I'm not Um But I did get one or two that did work. Uh, I'm trying to remember how Black Sheep goes. Uh, 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 black Sheep, have you any wool? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. It doesn't sound like that, but anyway. Um, but you, you, you have to take a bit of license with some of these things and, and 
fudge your notes a bit, especially if you're using the third octave of, of the bottom part of the keyboard, which may not be the same as the ones you Correct. actually want. Correct. Um, and all. you're rounding to whole numbers anyway, so... It's <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's an acceptable error, I think. Um, anyway, so this one is Beethoven's fifth. Oh, okay. So we'll just do that, and... There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, I've stuck in a rather long bit of silence at the end of that so that we're getting just the dock tones and not the uh, pitch of signal as well. Right. Okay. Right. So this one here, I'm going to see if you can figure this one out. <laughs> okay. Right. This is because this, this one actually does sound like what it's supposed to sound like. Um, and good evening, uh, Richard. Richard's uh, online. Hello, Richard. Right. I'm expecting big things from your SSTV, Richard, and playing. Uh, playing uh, pop tune or something. Okay, you listening? Here we go. Uh, hit TX. Okay. London Bridge is falling <laughs> <Bingo>. down. <laughs> yeah, well, I got that one. It's quite good, isn't it? It's, 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 it, it's fascinating how it shows it, because it actually is showing those tones. Very, very similar to... Um, yeah. Some of the WSJT modes. Yeah, it's jumping around. Yeah. But you can see how the audio filter would chop out anything well below 1200. And yeah. It does. And yeah. if you try 220 hertz, you can't hear it. Even yeah, with 440, okay. you can't hear it. So there's a limit on how far below the 1200 you can go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's it. That's um, I love it. Just a simple spreadsheet. It, it looks messy, but I just simply copy and paste each section and come up with a, a different solution. So, um, you know, and you can then tweak it to whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> and we've got uh, Ken, VK7DY, will it pay a banjo tune? <laughs> oh, I haven't tried, I haven't tried um, the River Inch or anything like that. <laughs> oh, definitely. Dueling banjos. The, the, other, the other gotcha is that you have a very limited number of notes. If the more notes you stick in there, the less likely it's going to work. Yeah. Um, and especially when it comes to the delay at the end because it'll just f ignore that completely or it may even not play all the notes. So, yeah, okay. Um, is there a limit to how much it will play? There would be a limit. I don't know what it is. Okay. They haven't sat down and listened to what's not playing. Yeah, okay. Um, but certainly, yeah, it, um, maybe that's why my call sign sounds wrong. Maybe it's not playing all of it. <laughs> it's quite a long... No, actually, I think it's it sounds as if it's playing more. That's, that's the... Oh, okay. Because y your call sign is actually really really short yeah from uh yeah. from uh so there's three dars at the at the at the end times mm. two yeah. with a space in the middle yeah, yeah. I, and i'm not getting a sense that there are it, it just sounds like there are probably six stars right that, okay. that's that's what it sounds so, like so it could be that i just haven't got the spacing correct yeah um but okay. it could well be also that being that long that it starts destroying the spacing yeah I don't know, I haven't really played with it that much, but I do know that if you put too many notes in there, it just doesn't work properly. Yeah, okay. It, it, it has a few bugs. R Richard's just said shades of the Micratic tunes. So the Micratic routers obviously <laughs> can play tunes as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good, Richard. Oh, I think playing tunes on um, plotters is probably the best part. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Probably, probably doesn't do their motors very good, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem at all. I mean, they played um, tunes on the Curiosity Rover on Mars, didn't they? Using its motors. Oh, did they? They did. Oh, well, there you go. They played, played Happy Birthday or something to us. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's it. I'm done. That, that is fantastic, Steve. Um, and I, I, I'm expecting now those people out there who are on the SSTV night. Um, yeah, yeah, invent something. Come up with correct. Something. You, you you want about ten or twelve characters. Um, try and keep it to that little number, and also how long it takes to send is the other thing too. You don't want to annoy people too much. Yeah. But yeah. So I'm expecting big things on Thursday night. <laughs> yeah, even if it's just Beethoven's fifth. Da 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 da. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, oh, and uh, yes, and uh, Ken's reminded us sharps go up and flats go down. So yes, yes, cool, cool, cool. Um, uh, that's that's excellent, Steve. Yeah, Thank you. I did I did have to put a, uh, a flat in there to get uh, Beethoven's fifth. Um, oh, well, that's the, the last no, the last note to flat. Now, <clears throat> do you realise um, that during the war, 
um, Beethoven's fifth was actually used as a, uh, a hidden meaning mm. because if you think about it, the first four notes are da 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 is the letter V for yeah. victory. Yes. So um, it was there, there was a bit of a hidden uh, hidden meaning in there. Now that's an excellent segue. What? That's an excellent excellent segue. I was looking at the the paper at lunchtime this morning, and. <laughs> Yeah. I, I always look at the um, I, I definitely always look at the um, the hatch match and dispatch. Oh, okay. Um, be, to make sure I'm not in there. Um, so um, that's what my that's what my my father used to say all the time. Now there is there was a obituary uh, in there for a Joyce Court. Um, 6th of May 1924 to the 1st of June 2021, Joyce Carr, Kathleen Court, Nee Compton. Now, the next bit of information is what caught my eye. She was a petty officer in the Women's Royal Navy Service, the Wren, specialising in signals and decoding. Oh. Um, Joyce went to, enlisted in 1941, Joyce went ashore in Normandy on the first day of operation, which must have been pretty scary, um, op Operation Neptune on D-Day. Following the war, she continued with the British Navy as a member of Lord Mountbatten's staff, huh. stationed at Malta, late of Hobart. Wow. So, um, <laughs> hence the segue... <laughs> I just sort of went, you read those sort of obituaries and you go, wow, imagine the life that she had. Just whew, very full one, not by the sound of it. Yeah, but um, yeah. um, anyway. None, none of us could imagine what it would have been like. Well and truly. People in that era would have gone through. Correct. And being on a landing on D-Day, <laughs> just you got to be kidding. You mm. have absolutely got to be kidding. Mm. Now, Steve, stick around. Stick around. Because... You've got a toy. Okay. Well, I'm making a toy. That's oh, okay. I'm better. <laughs> making a toy. So, my problem... I'll start off with a problem statement. <laughs> the problem statement is... I have a um, very nice... Uh, what's called a Hercules amplifier. HF... Uh, 6 metre HF amplifier. Goes all the way down to 160 metres, all the way up to 6 metres. Um, it is... The, the reason it's called Hercules is it's one of the HPSDR... Yeah, and they've all got wonderful names. They've all got wonderful <laughs> Greek god names. <laughs> and this particular amplifier, a really robust amplifier, gives about a... If you push it about 150 watts, um, it's got all of the low-pass filters in it. Um, it's got a 6-metre... Uh, it's actually got a 6-metre... LNA in it as well, because oh, okay. um, six meters is a bit deaf. Um, so it, really nice. It's got a little control panel. It's got a little micro con um, controller control panel that enables you to set, you know, w where it switches off with SWR, if it overheats, when to switch the fan on, all of this sort of stuff. So it's really nice amplifier. Mm. And when you connect it to a HPSDR, it's all controlled through an I2C bus. Yeah. Which is great. That's that's fantastic, and everything just happens, and the the amplifier just switches and whatever else. But I wanted to actually use the amplifier on the IC705. Oh, okay. That's what I was thinking mm -hmm. about yep. to give give that a little bit more power. The problem I've got is I could go through, and I thought about this. I could go through and build up a little interface that converts, you know, um, CVI to I2C, <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going. This is getting too hard. <laughs> When in fact, all I really need to be able to do is manually switch the low pass filters. Yep. So and then I started thinking about how am I going to do that? And I, I started, I, I thought, okay, what I need is some sort of switch arrangement, some sort of latching switch arrangement that enables you to select one and keep it on um, because they're only momentary mm. when you, the signals, those signals come out on a little um, DB25, so you can actually get to them, which is fantastic. Um, they're little uh, active low signals. So I thought, I need a switch panel. Now, in the studio, we, we actually use um, some XABC equipment, which is 
a video switching um, uh, matrix that is was actually made in just Australia, like one of just like one, of, <laughs> just like one, of, one I prepared earlier, um, which has a whole lot of switches, which have all got LEDs on them, uh, very nice little uh, tactile feedback switches um, that go to a switching matrix, a video switching matrix. Now. We had we got a whole lot of these extra apart from this video switching matrix. So I thought this is actually exactly what I want, but I'm not sure how these work. <laughs> um, so we'll, I'll, I'll just show you the the panel. The panel. Um, and it turns out this is reliable technology. <laughs> this from is the seventies and eighties. The seventies and eighties, which yeah. is. The era that I used to do things with electronics. <laughs> so you can see it's it's got 16. Surprise that magic number 16. Yeah. Um, I'll go into that in a sec. 16 buttons, um, and each of these you can you can switch. And when when it's powered, you switch this, and the light comes on, the LED comes on, etc. etc. Now, normally, it, what what it actually came out of, it comes out on a. If you have a look at the back, there's a DB9 here. Um, and I thought, oh, well, okay, it's got to be some sort of encoding because 60, there's not 16 lines that come out there, so it's got mm -hmm. to be encoding it in some way, shape, or form. So, in usual sadistic form, <laughs> I sat down and I traced the circuit out. <laughs> and somebody will go, oh, my God, what did you do that for? So, so how many times did you trace it out to get it to actually look like that? Oh, uh, well, Don't if you... you dare actually, your first drawing. No, no, if you have a look underneath... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> and, and you never know quite how to lay it out properly. And so certainly don't know if you go down it. here, it, it's just, oh, my God, what's going on here? <laughs> but anyway, so then I redrew it. Now, this is, this is standard. Um, it uses standard CMOS, and there's a couple of op amps in here. Um, there is a 555, which is supplying the clock that's, that is uh, doing the counting throughout this circuit. You can see the clock output goes into a, a 4024, which is a counter. You can see there's a clock input, there's a reset input, and then it counts in binary down here. And those binary um, lines go to a 4051, which is a binary to decimal converter, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. which gives you, surprise, surprise, 8 and 8, which is the 16 switches that it goes to. Um, and you'll notice that the reset switch here goes back into the circuit. There's a little... Now, the, these are um, NOR gates. Um, and the, Sorry, these are OR gates. Yep. OR gates. And they're in a little debounce arrangement. Yep. So you actually use the race condition in the gates uh, against each other to do a little bit of a debounce. Now, the reason you need debounce, when you've got anything... Um, digital that is sampling a mechanical switch, the switch bounces. If you if you look at it in in really really fine degrees of time, you'll see that the switch as you push it is on and off and then on and then off and then on and then off and, and then finally might be milliseconds apart. Correct, and finally it's on. And the problem is a, a, a microprocessor sampling that or a circuit sampling that will actually see it switch multiple times and then switch on. And you don't want you don't want all that, that time when it switches on and off. So you need what's called a D, either a debounce circuit, which is what this is, or you need your microprocessor that's sampling the switch. Debounce logic. Correct. <coughs> to go through a little cycle where it samples, it resamples, it's, it's, and if it samples it enough times and says, okay, it's now down, <laughs> and you then put the flag on down or whatever whatever the, the, the circuit does. So, a so, little bit of a, 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 a debounce arrangement. There is a, a, a circuit here which enables you to, this, this switch here, um, this is, uh, a 4051 is an analog switch. So what's happening here is this is determining which one of these goes to the output. Yep. And the output then goes through a, a, a level converter here with the, the op amps and ends up back actually doing the reset 
of the counter. So what this is saying is, um, when it when it finds one of these is down, it resets that circuit and stops the counting. Right. So as soon as you push another button, it goes. It starts that circuit going again. So, so very interesting. But the key thing here is the output of here actually goes to a whole lot of latches. So, so just take a step yep. back, Justin. That's Sorry. A, I'm assuming then that the circuit normally isn't scanning. It's only when you push a button that it does a brief scan. Correct. Correct. Yep. Correct. Right. Um, and, and then resets and latches on that. So the resets more an off signal. Correct. Yep. Well and truly. Yep. Well and truly. Then, so the output and and what happens is when it when it it finally gets that it knows which one's down it latches and in fact my my crappy circuit on the other one shows this better because <laughs> um, i didn't draw this bit um this counter the four bits of this counter then go to in that reset state yeah. it latches those four those four bits into a little latch here so one or other of the, 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 the state, if you like, of that counter is latched into here, goes through a transistor, and you get a binary number mm -hmm. here, which is the one that's switched. Yeah. So, so I, I, at that point, I knew that what comes out that little DB9 connector is a... Oh, bugger. I just dropped the mouse again. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's right. Um, I do that. I need the mouse on a tether. <laughs> um, so what I what I then what I then did was I thought, okay, great. We've got we've then got a binary signal that comes out of there. That's great. That's really easy to then deal with. So what we what we get is a four zero two eight, and I went out to JCAR and got a four a couple of four zero two eights because they still sell CMOS gates. 4028s are binary in and decimal out. So you get um, uh, four bits of binary in and then you get uh, eight, eight bits out here. What I also did was then put a buffer on here. So this is a hex, this is a hex buffer. So there's six of these in a package. Um, and if you get a one in here, you get a zero out here and vice versa. So if it's zero, it's one. And ca that comes out to a, um, a couple of jumpers which enable me to either grab this side, which is the the, the high output, or this side, which is the low output. So, so, they're, not, so they're not buffers, they're inverters. They're inverters. Oh, sorry, they're, they're inverters, well and truly. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so what I can do is, for each of these outputs, I can either switch them to high, be it a high output switch or a low output switch, uh, just based on where the jumper is. And you can see, what I then did, this is the this is the little additional board that I put in here, uh, little matrix board, and you can see here's the counter. There are the four bits here that input into it, and then these are the the uh, the hex inverters, the two hex inverters. Now I've I've I need um, I need eight of them, and there's only six in a package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so um, so I've used part of both of those packages, and this is the this is the the um, uh, the little header that enables you to set either the low or the high side uh, for each of those eight signals. Um, this then plugs into the the and, su and supplies power here, and then on the back of the the panel I've put a DB25, uh, which I haven't connected up yet because there's 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 the end of it there, <laughs> a bit of ribbon cable. Uh, and that'll come out onto a DB25, which will supply power and also the uh, the outputs. And that DB25, I'm wiring it to look exactly like the DB25 on the amplifier. So yeah. I just literally have a DB25 to DB25 connector, and that's it. Yeah. It'll 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 work. So uh, and then I'll change the little labels. You can pull off these little plastic bits here and change the labels to to be uh, bands. Um, and um, it should be uh, well and truly ready for the RD. Oh, good. Speaking <laughs> <laughs> of which, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> uh, well, neither am I. Um, um, <laughs> I'm going to make a start this weekend. <laughs> um, 
so that's 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 a little bit of a uh, I, I suppose you'd call it a bit of a hack <laughs> no it's an excellent project um it's actually excellent project and, and there's a straightforward way to solve the problem correct and and i i love the fact that i'm reusing this mm. because um I kept these because they had really nice switches on them yeah. and all I was going to do with it was take the switches off and yeah. use them for other projects. Now mm. I'm actually using this and all I'm doing is literally supplementing it um, and getting a, a, a usable device um, into the future. So I hope, um, I hope I can use it for all sorts of things. But anyway, mm. that's, um, that's the manual switch hack <laughs> that I was talking about. People will probably looked at what I wrote in the broadcast and went, what the hell was he talking about? Yeah, they usually do that. <laughs> it's just Justin. Don't worry yeah, about it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, now how are we going for time? All right, um, we'll do uh, we'll do low low um, low key. Now, I've been threatening to do this for a while, so I apologise for um, I apologise for this. Now, Low Key Magazine, uh, Low Key Magazine is the journal of the VK QRP Club. Fantastic little journal if you're into um, homebrew. Uh, this particular one really caught my eye, and Steve Steve knows exactly what he's looking at. Uh, do you agree? <laughs> That's a vacuum variable capacitor. Yep. Can I just mention, make a mention? I come across a, a video today because um, I don't know why I just happened to be strolling strolling through Facebook videos, and there was a whole pile of um, magnetic loop related okay. videos, and one showed a particular amateur uh, with a camera. On his vacuum variable capacitor, and you could see a corona glow inside the capacitor. Ooh, <laughs> so, okay. Well, I just wonder how high that was running, <laughs> and Ooh. I wouldn't necessarily be that close to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because mm. the, the the what what would that one be rated at from a voltage point of view? Ten thousand volts. Yeah. Okay. Well, at least. Yeah. And and ten thousand volts. Uh, ten thousand volts in dry air. Not in a vacuum, but ten thousand volts in dry air yeah. is ten millimeters. Yeah. That's it's, it's a thousand volts a millimeter is the rule of thumb. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and, he's, and he's peering through a perspex window into this um, enclosure that has this vacuum variable capacitor and glowing, Ooh. glowing reddish blue, <laughs> so from so both colours. And a fair bit of power running in that. Loop. I have no idea how close he was to the actual loop. <laughs> anyway. Um, Yes, okay. <laughs> Warning for all, don't be very close to a magnetic loop when it's in operation. Uh, definitely. So, um, so Low Key Magazine. Um, uh, for those, we'll, we'll just do a, a quick review. Um, and I think it's it's DOC, um, VK5BUG is the, the, the magnetic loop. A uh, little bit of uh, introduction um, um, by... Uh, by Terry VK two KJ KJ KTJ uh, HF loop remote tuning by Bob McHugh. Um, so it, no, sorry, it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, Doc. Uh, now uh, Trevor uh, Trevor Quick VK five ATQ President's Notes, um, and he, he talks about the uh, the hour contest, the the QRP hour contest, and there, there is the the results in here, which I want to point out a few call cool signs in there. Uh, the ten year club by Don Callow, um, uh, the ten twenty thirty uh, year club, uh, and um, you can get the past issues of, uh, of of low key. The QRP hours contest results. This is what I actually wanted to show. Now Andrew, one of the Andrews, the VK one Andrews. If you if somebody calls in from VK one, and you call them Andrew, you've got a pretty good chance of being right. Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. There's a lot of them. A lot of Andrews, isn't there? <laughs> and this is one of them, VK1DA. He's a, one, a very nice guy, lovely guy, lovely guy. Now, the the results. Um, we've got VK5LJ here. If we go down the list, VK7AG, Anthony, with five, came in fifth. Um, and now this is uh, SSB, under CW. If we go down the list, go down the list, VK7LTD. Tony with uh, had four, uh, score of four. He came in seventh, but the big, big, big uh, one here is uh, first in the digital section with VK seven STO. He got four, a, a score of four, and he came first because oh, he was the only one. He's the only one, yeah. <laughs> so does, does he get a certificate? There you go. <laughs> there you go. And uh, the comments that came in um, now. 
Small uh, HF loop antennas, Bob McHugh, VK2 AVQ, is the, uh, this is the, the cover sheet. And you can see, uh, that's his, that's his, he, he talks about uh, his shack in a cupboard. Oh, okay. Shack I used to have a shack in a cupboard. So, oh. very, very good. And some of the loops that he's been experimenting with, uh, and here's, here's the, the loop that is on the front cover. Um, I think that's um, Heliax. I, I think it's Heliax. Actually, just let me have a look. Sorry, just that looks suspiciously like Heliax. Um, <laughs> um, mm. And you can see on the front, um, basically, he stripped off the end and then flattened it, which has got uh, the, the the rings that then go around each of the plates yeah. of the. the but the has capacitor. he bolted it on? Has he? Yes. Yeah. Oh, bad. bad. <laughs> yeah. It needs to be sweated on, doesn't it? it does Actually, right. silver soldered well, on. Well, you can't sweat it onto the capacitor itself. But the the, uh, the rings are the only point of mechanical contact that you end up in a loop in the, in that situation. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you you sweat the the um, heliax onto the, onto, on the onto the ring. Yeah. And then, okay. you, then you clamp it onto the capacitor, and of course that's silver lined anyway, so that should yeah. be a, a really good connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you would destroy the capacitor if you heated it up enough to melt it, melt the the, uh, the glass. Well, you would break it. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's let's not, not do that. No, let's definitely not do that, given the price <laughs> they're, they're of very vacuum <laughs> capacitors. <laughs> Um, now, uh, Peter Parker, VK3YE, of course, at 3.579 megahertz memories. So he, he's got a whole lot of input from different people using the Colorburst crystal. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> That's um, the, the, the NTSC Colorburst crystal, mm -hmm. um, So, uh, which, of course, were, were used in... Um, American in, TV. Uh, yeah. Well and truly, and yes. were significantly available everywhere and anywhere. Um, so... Um, so yeah, that was uh, instantly on 80 meters. Now, is a contest hammering your favorite band? Try 10 megahertz or 30 meters with a big bore 0.64 wavelength helical. This is oh. one of the things that Doc, um, uh, uh, Doc VK5BUG uh, has done a lot of articles on, both in AR and also in uh, Low Key Magazine, are uh, big bore verticals. Now, big bore verticals are um, large, actually, let me turn over the page. Um, reasonably large PVC pipe, uh, long PVC pipe, and, and literally uh, uh, a helical that is wound for the length of that bit of pipe. And right. we're talking about a pipe that ends up like six metres long. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and he, he talks about uh, all the characteristics and the things you've got to take into account with a big bore vertical. He, he has used them for 160 metres, he's used them for 630 metres, uh, right down low in those low HF and MF oh, frequencies. Okay. So, so yeah. I've never heard of a big bore antenna. Yeah, well, and show here. Um, here's his little tuning arrangement at the base of it, and you can see the base, um, the base of the the PVC. So you get a bit of an idea. It's a you're talking about sort of oh what a ninety or hundred mil. ninety or hundred mil piece of pipe. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, a bit of a visual problem there. Uh, yeah, I noticed that he paints all of his a sort of camo. Um, I've discovered that yeah. um, uh, when I when I built my Pexal Pex loop, which is bright yellow, yeah, very visible. But then you painted um, um, basically a dark grey, which is uh, okay. one of the color, color bond colours. Yep, basalt the colour. Okay, uh, it disappears. Because the sky completely gone. disappears. Don't no, get into the background. The uh, yeah, okay. behind, it's completely. You just can't see it. There you go. Yeah. I love it. <coughs> Hmm. We could we could do a segment on camouflage. Yeah, it's um, very effective. <laughs> and, and you can see here he, he he's camouflaged these. It, it, it's sort of a greeny brown sort of splotchy arrangement. <laughs> and I think he's ex um I think he's ex military. Yeah, yeah uh, like military <laughs> camouflage, doesn't it? So um, uh, but this is this is on his uh, back fence on his back shed. Um, so uh, uh, oh hello. Uh, and does that require a ground plan? Hello to Gary. Um, yes, it does. I think oh, okay. it, it does need um, it, it does need some form of, of, of a stake or, or uh, radials, um, which I think he runs along the fence rails yeah. <laughs> from memory from reading. Um, now, um, member classifieds. Uh, we've got Chris uh, Thompson VK One CT, uh, who does um, uh, one of the ones that I, I call Andrew. Um, um, <laughs> Does a, a, a crossword each uh, each uh, uh, each edition, 
Um, application for membership now. Membership uh, in Australia is the princely sum of fifteen dollars, and you get one of these every two months. Oh, okay, that's so six editions. Yeah. Um, and they also have, uh, they do have a part store of, of the, the sort of the relatively hard bits and pieces to get, so you, uh, you, you get at reasonable rates. Um, they've got a, a net and frequencies that you can be on, both CW and also SSB. Um, oh, and here we go. Here's a colour version of the... Yeah. Zoom in big here. Big bore antenna. So you can see, yeah, well, there's there's a strap yeah. uh, which goes to the, I assume, the shed roof. Um, there's a feed line into, this is the little tuning capacitor arrangement that he's got on the bottom. Yep. And then the bottom of it that's um, mounted on that, the... That'd be a lump of 6 4 Yeah. Well, 6 4 4 well, sorry. Bit what, of 4 b 2 Well and truly. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and this is a Doc's 30 metre uh, helical vertical showing the roof bonding and ground radials. These are the radials here, mm. so they head off in each direction. They're above the. Yeah. On one of his, he he laid them uh, laid them out along the the, the top fence rail. Yeah. I remember that uh, for reading that. So anyway, so that's um uh, that's Low Key Magazine. Uh, that's the June twenty twenty two edition. Uh, so it won't be long, and I'll be getting another one of these. But um, great little articles, um, and they they're always calling out for uh, any experimentation and bits and pieces that you actually do. Um, please, please, please send uh, send them in. So uh, so there you go. Now, what we might do, we've got uh, nine minutes. What we might do is just do a quick reset of the um, the studio, and I want to show you. The Ryden power supply that we showed the other day um, has a battery charging function that I came across, uh, and I was going to demonstrate the battery charging function. Let me yep. move that. Um, so we'll just do a bit of a reset. Uh, what am I doing? Going to sleep. Oh no, that's all right. It's um, I'll I'll show. Uh, uh, one, one, no. Uh, oh, that's better. Now, let's go down. So, this is the Ryden uh, RD6018 power supply. Um, now, 6018, uh, 60 volts, 18 amps is what it's capable of. We'll switch it on, um, and uh, I showed last time uh, how to set, uh, you've got the voltage that you set it to, you've got uh, the voltage you want it to go to, the current you want it to go to, it's both voltage and current limiting, and, and then you can also set um, the over voltage and over current uh, settings on it as well. Um, especially for the particular this particular battery function because one of the peculiar things about this particular power supply is there's a, a black a red so there's a negative and a positive and then in the middle there's a green one and you think oh that's the earth hmm. no it's not it's common it's no it's the battery output oh, okay. <laughs> so you've got you see down here there's a little battery symbol yep. If I, I've got a, um, a LiPo, uh, LiPo battery here, if I actually connect the battery in the container, you'll notice that um, at some point it will, this will go mm -hmm. red. And of course it's not going to do it for me, is it? <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Maybe it's not making connection. I notice the, uh, oh, there we go. Ah. Maybe it's this holder. There we go. Okay. So it actually knows that there is something connected for a start. And you'll notice here, it'll it, this, this change, yeah, 4.15 volts. So it's actually detected that there's a voltage there. What it also does is, I mentioned last time, there is a thermocouple that plugs into this on the back. Um, you can... Uh, you can then tape that thermocouple uh, to the battery 
and it will read off the temperature here. If I if I hold on to the thermocouple here, you'll notice that the temperature is yes, 27, 28 degrees, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, it's not bad. The only problem is um, you would sort of think that you could then set the temperature at which it shut down the power supply. Mm -hmm. You can't. No. <laughs> it's just telling you the temperature. <laughs> Oh, okay. uh, which is one of the you sort of went oh they just went it's not quite so far there but anyway um, so now there's a really nice little feature here if we switch this on you'll notice it goes up it goes up to 4.38 which is what the charging voltage is here I've set it to 0.5 uh, amps it's gone to 0.48 so it's gone to the maximum uh, uh, current it's constant current, so this is little CC here, and you can set it to constant voltage as well. It's giving you the energy, so the, the watts. Um, but there is a really nice little function here that enables you to do, if we go into the menu, and then go here, and... There is a little data logging arrangement. Okay. So if I start charging, you'll notice this is this is now that's the over voltage and over current that I've set it to. This is the the output that it's supplying the battery, and you'll notice, unfortunately, you can't you can't change this scale, but mm -hmm. this is the voltage and the current here that is actually plotting every so often, and as the battery goes up in voltage or current or whatever else, it actually plots it on the uh, on there and. If you, this particular power supply, you can connect the USB connected to it, which is here, and there is an application that you can run on your PC that gives you a whole lot more charts and graphs. So and you're, So you're only seeing voltage or current there? Well and truly, yeah. well, well and truly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but really nice little feature. Um, so you can then, uh, probably on your PC, you can then have a look on the PC to see what's happening with the battery over a, a sort of an extended period of time. Oh, okay. So, um, so anyway, that's um, and, and you you set up the, the the voltage and the current that you you obviously relate to the the battery um, that you're you're charging, but it, it just gives you a little uh, data logging arrangement. Now there is a RD six sixty eighteen. W here mm. and there's a, a, a little header inside which enables you to stick a Wi-Fi module in it oh, okay. <laughs> and you can have an application on your iPhone or your Android phone which enables you to get all of this information mm. on your phone and actually yeah. control the power supply via your phone. Oh, okay. So I thought that was pretty tricky. Um, I didn't get the Wi-Fi module, but I'm, I'm now sort of thinking, mm, maybe I'll try and get hold of a Wi-Fi <laughs> module and stick it in there. But uh, anyway, so um, so there's the battery, the battery charging function, which uh, now if we go back uh, and enter, oh. And again, okay, we're back to where we were. Now, I just wanted to show you one. Somebody said to me, "Why do you want a 60 volt, 18 amp power supply?" Yeah, why do you want a 60 volt, 18 amp oh, power supply? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'll, I'll give you a classic example here. Um, I uh, I was given. Oh, all right. Now this is this is a out of a commercial bit of lighting equipment, yep. um, and the, there were two of these, so it was it was it was in series, and I put my power supplies on the on here, and my power supplies I can get up to about twenty four volts, twenty six, twenty eight volts, and it did absolutely nothing, <laughs> and I thought, oh well, maybe it's maybe it's bugger. But then I went, I wonder if it actually needs higher. 36 volts or something. Or something above it. Yeah. So, here I've got my new power supply. <laughs> so, if I connect up to the, to the positive and the negative on here, what I did was quietly wound the voltage up to see... Now, uh, voltage set uh, will go to, uh, well, 
Given 28 volts didn't get me anywhere, we'll go up to, I don't know, 40 volts um, and enter. And 0.5. So we'll try 40 volts. Oh, no, hang on. <laughs> Let me unset the... <laughs> <laughs> unset the over the um the over voltage, the over voltage <laughs> limits um oh hang on no shift over voltage is how i and we go up to 62 volts <laughs> now we're at 40 volts nothing absolutely nothing absolutely nothing um just to show you um, so let's wind up let's set the voltage oh hang on a little bit of light you just watch the current 0 0.07 0 0.07 so not much 0 0.1 and that's starting to get pretty bright. Um, yeah. Don't really want to go much further than that. So um, I thought, well, that says to me it's about 55 volts. So I wrote 55 volt DC on the back. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so it gives you an idea um, of it's about takes it, that strip takes about 55 volts to get it to light up. Oops. Um, um, and uh, yeah, mm. I sort of went. Well, that's why I need a, uh, a higher voltage and maybe not a higher current, but a higher voltage power supply. So, uh, it kind of makes sense because two of them in series are 110 volts US power level. Correct, correct, yeah. correct. So, so yeah, um, anyway, that's um, that's a bit of a bit of a, a, a show of the the Ryden uh, power supply and what you can do with it, which uh, and yeah i now know that that's a 55 volt so if i have an application where i have 110 volts which is two of them i've got two of those strips and they both work um then uh then yeah i can use them but um <laughs> well, if you get four of these in series and, and a diode um correct directly up the 240 volts there you go <laughs> um bang <laughs> i've actually got um i've actually got a two four I'm, I'm scared to actually connect 240 volts to it because I don't. <laughs> this thing, this is a panel which is a, a hundred watt LED yeah. matrix yeah. that it is. It needs to be on a heatsink. Yeah. You, you can't run it without a heatsink. But it's it's about the size. It's about it's about the size of a cigarette packet actually. <laughs> Yeah. one I prepared earlier yeah. that we got from the roof it's about that size and the segment is about 10 mil square mm. oh no hang on 15 20 mil square that's where the light actually comes from there's two big connectors on either side and it's designed to run from 240 volts oh really you actually connect 240 volts to it AC AC wow so and I dread to think what sort of noise comes out of it but anyway um, probably not a lot but, yeah. but no it's a hundred watts it's basically a hundred watt led and i i yeah so anyway i i'll, I'll connect it up one day and, and be amazed but anyway anyway that's now finish off um we have a whole bucket load of things happening uh the 30th of july is our training and assessment day um now fox hunt for those who don't know the fox hunt was going to occur this saturday uh, the 23rd it is it has been postponed to the 6th of August uh, because we have some some people out with COVID uh, key people out with COVID good old COVID <laughs> three cheers for COVID <laughs> so the fox hunt day is the 6th of August it's Saturday the 6th of August from 9 30 up here uh, the 3rd of August which is our next um, presentation night so it's the Wednesday before that Fox Hunt Day. We've got Joe Stevens, VK7JS, uh, coming down to give us a talk on uh, his development of the accessible GD77 firmware. Now, for those who don't know, Joe is actually totally blind. Um, and so he develops a whole range of software 
Uh, one that I've come across, which is how I know Joe, is the JAWS software. Mm -hmm. Excellent software too. JAWS is a screen reader software uh, which enables the output in um, uh, speech or braille. Yep. Um, I've seen it in use by a, braille, by a blind person, so it's yep. absolutely excellent. No, no. And, yep. and Joe's, Joe's the developer behind that, but um, from an amateur radio, he's also a, a ham. Uh, he's basically created the accessible GD77, which is a replacement firmware for the GD77, but there's also a couple of Baofangs, um, which he, you can also use the firmware in. Oh, okay. So there's a couple of others. Now, he's agreed to come down uh, with his son and give us a talk on the 3rd of August on the accessible GD77. So we can ask him questions. We have the developer in the <laughs> in the the, the, the club rooms. Um uh, talking about the software, so it should be fantastic. Um, and yeah, 6th of August is the fox hunt. And the other thing, uh, the last thing, the 5th and 6th of November, save the date, it is the Tassie Ham Radio Conference and Expo. We've got a whole day of presentations on the Saturday, and then the Ham Fest uh, Ham Expo on the Sunday. Um, we already almost have filled all the presentation slots wow so uh, lots of people and lots of people want to come down in person it's being held at uh, the stanley burberry theater at utas if you've never been to the stanley burberry theater it is uh, absolutely fantastic facility um, very comfy chairs in fact probably too comfy people are going to go to sleep um, <laughs> But great facility, big foyer area where the vendors are going to be set up. Uh, so should be a fantastic show. 5th and 6th of November, save the date. Excellent. So um, on that note, we'll bid you farewell. Uh, catch you next week, another uh, DRTV night next week. And uh, we'll see you around. So 73. Cheers. Uh,